Well, hey there. This is Kim Constable. Welcome to the Strong and Sculpted podcast, the podcast by me, Kim Constable, also known as the Sculpted Vegan, about all things strong and, of course, all things sculpted. Now, what are we going to talk about today? Well, we are going to talk about something that some of you who follow me on Instagram or who are in my Facebook groups may remember. And that thing we called Fruitgate. Yes, today we are going to talk about Fruitgate. Now, what the hell is Fruitgate? Well, I'm going to tell you what Fruitgate is in a little minute, but it's basically when I posted a short snapshot of um, an excerpt that was taken from one of the talks that I do, one of the Q&As that I do in my private Facebook groups within, you know, my 18-month program or any of the programs, I had done a QA and a one day and we had been discussing fruit. Somebody was asking, you know, should they be eating fruit um, on a diet and whatever? And so I began discussing fruit and its effect on the liver and the fact that it was full of fructose. And I basically said, you know, very emphatically, Fruit is making you fat because this girl was literally eating fruit for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. She was like a fruit junkie and she just couldn't lose weight. And the reason why she couldn't lose weight was because she was eating far too much fruit. So I, um, we posted this on my Instagram and I have never had a backlash like I had had over Fruitgate never before and never since, Right. The backlash that I got from posting a video, a short video on my Instagram, which suggested that fruit may be making you fat, was unbelievable. So anyway, today we're going to discuss Fruitgate. We're going to discuss fruit and fructose and whether it's good for you or bad for you. And of course, we're going to take it a little bit deeper than just fruit. And we're going to go into the hows and the whys and the what fors of how we even get this invested in something being the way we need it to be in the first place. So before we get into the content, let me just remind you that um, we choose a winner every single month of one of our Sculpted Vegan programs. We just chose the winner and announced it on Instagram last week. Um, and you can could win one of our Sculpted Vegan programs, all you have to do is leave a review wherever you listen to the podcast and send me a screenshot of the review on Instagram. If you do not send me a screenshot, we cannot award you a program simply because the screenshot is how we get your Instagram name and that is how we contact you and that is how we find you. Because otherwise, if we have to go on looking at all the reviews, we don't know how to contact you because we don't have any details for you on all the different you know platforms. And also, we wouldn't have the time to check all of the different platforms where this podcast is um, is published. So if you want to win a Sculpted Vegan program, send me a screenshot of your review on Instagram. My Instagram handle is The Sculpted Vegan and you could be in with the chance of winning one of our Sculpted Vegan programs. So anyway, uh, what happened with Fruit Gate? Well, I had like um, different like vegan fitness models and people like completely ripping me apart. And it was um, it was quite stressful at the time. I can laugh about it now. But what I realized was, one, <laughs> not everybody has your back. And two, uh, people actually enjoy putting other people down, especially people who are doing really well in the world. And of course, I'm doing really well in the fitness industry. And I didn't never occur to me that that makes people jealous. So anyway, what also though happened was... <laughs> I realized people are very, very, very attached to their fruit. Don't you dare try and come between a person and their fruit. How dare you suggest that fruit might not be the ultimate healthiest choice that we can ever have in our entire lives? Honestly, I was absolutely stupid stunned by some of the comments, by how angry people were getting at the mere suggestion that fruit might not be the holy grail of food. And so I was like, uh, okay, uh, Fruitgate, let's stay well away from that subject in future because it's obviously just too emotive for people. So why am I going to talk about Fruitgate in this podcast? Well, here's what happened yesterday, just to give you a little back uh, information. So um, there's a, a guy who I would follow on Instagram. I've known him for years and years and years. I don't know him personally, but I we have mutual friends. His name is Lewis House, right? Now, Lewis, really nice guy, really like what he stands for. He interviewed uh, Dr. Stephen Gundry on 
his podcast. Now, Dr. Stephen Gundry is the author of The Plant Paradox. And um, a chiropractor that I would go to, who I would respect, told me about The Plant Paradox years ago, and he told me that I should read it. And I did buy the book, but I never actually got around to reading it. But I think that it's um, he talks a lot about how he doesn't believe that um, eating grains or eating beans and things is good for us because of the lectins and, you know, different things, whatever. But it's not something I ever got around to reading, so I'm not really familiar with his philosophies. But you know, I read a lot of philosophies, read a lot of books. I don't just look for information that supports what I know. I actually look for information that challenges what I know because I like to, you know, have, I don't want to create an echo tunnel. I like to to see both sides and look at different point of views and then make up my own mind about things. So Lewis anyway, posted an excerpt of Dr. Stephen Gundry talking about fruit and about how we should steer away from fruit because, and obviously this was just like a snapshot taken of a long conversation. He was saying about, you know, we feed our kids fruit and fruit juices are the worst thing that we can do. And about how, um, you know, if you just throw all of your fruit into a blender in the morning and you have that before to go, you go to work, it's absolutely destroying your mitochondria and about how, you know, it's spiking your blood sugar and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, uh oh. And I sent it to my husband. I was like, Lewis has entered Fruitgate. And I reposted it on my story um, because I thought it was great what he was saying, because it's true. It supports a lot of my uh, theories about fruit, and uh, which we're going to discuss in a minute, by the way. But um, so then I wrote to Lewis and I was like, uh oh, <laughs> you entered Fruitgate. I bet you didn't expect this because I was reading through the comments. And of course, exactly what had happened to me had happened to Lewis. The Fruit Brigade came out in full force. How dare you challenge people's views on fruits? And it was amazing how angry and upset people were getting. And they were ripping Dr. Stephen Gundry apart. And they were ripping Lewis Howes apart. And they were getting very, very, very upset. Like you would have thought that someone had literally dropped some kind of atomic bomb on the nation. Like this is how upset and angry people were getting. And I was tittering away to myself. And so Lewis wrote back and he was like, holy good fuck. Like, what the hell? He said, this wasn't even my opinion. This was me interviewing this guy. And he said, the backlash I've gotten is unbelievable. People are like, I'm unfollowing you. How dare you post this on your Instagram account? That's it. I thought that you stood for something better than this. You have this quack, this asshole, this whatever. Basically, what these people are saying is, how dare you challenge what I believe to be true about fruit? How dare you have a differing opinion? We're so closed off to opinions, but we are going to discuss this in a second. So, so anyway, I was thinking whenever I was going to report this co- record this podcast this week, I was like, oh, I think Fruitgate needs to come out into the open once more because I never really got a chance to really explain Fruitgate. Not that I really wanted to. And of course, people had made up their minds about, you know, I lost so many followers. It was like people, like, that's it. I'm unfollowing you. This is disgusting. How dare you say that fruit is not good for me? So first of all, Let's just talk a little bit about fruit, okay? So I remember a few years ago, let me think, how many years? Probably before I started bodybuilding, I would say about six years ago. I've always been, maybe seven, I've always been really, really interested in the body. I've always been interested in food and how it affects the body and all of that good stuff. And so um, I've also obviously been obsessed with weight loss and fat loss over the years because a lot of fat shaming happened in my family whenever I was growing up. And so, you know, being lean and being really, uh, not even thin, but just being really lean and really muscular has always been something that I have absolutely loved and always something that I have strived towards. And I remember a few years ago, I discovered um, a book by Tim Ferriss and it was called The 4-Hour Work Week, right? And I absolutely loved The 4-Hour Work Week. It, it spoke to me I knew that I wanted to, you know, build something big in the world and I loved all the strategies and the different things that he uh, he taught. And so I started implementing a lot of the strategies from the four hour work week. And then I found the four hour body, which was his second book. And this was basically a Bible on fat loss. Now, I loved Tim Ferriss simply because the amount of research that he does before he writes any book or does his podcast or does anything in his life. Tim is an absolute and utter information junkie. And he uses his own body as an experiment for everything that he does, kind of like what I do. I like to feel it in my body, try it on, understand it, get all that inductive learning. And then that's how I'm able to teach it to other people. Because once you have experienced it and felt it in your own body, you are so much more able to um, to teach other people. So I find The 4-Hour Body by Tim 
And the, the, the principles of this book, I do talk about a lot in my programs. I love the principles of this book. So he taught me about what we call the slow carb principle. So that's his words, not mine, the slow carb principle, which is basically where if you eat most of your carbohydrates from beans, lentils, and green cruciferous vegetables, your body will not store body fat. And that's one of the fundamental principles that I've carried forward in all of my teaching that I do. And it's why I've been so successful in bodybuilding. And just as a little caveat, as a little FYI, we are actually running a meal planning masterclass on Sunday, the 23rd of August, 2020. It's a live workshop, a three hour workshop with me live where I'm going to teach exactly how to meal plan as a vegan athlete or not even as an athlete, but how to meal plan and how to plan your food um, so that you are getting the best possible benefit from it with your training and with your muscle growth and with your fat loss. And I'm going to be teaching a lot of the principles in that. So go to our website. If you haven't heard about that already, go to the website um, and you can sign up for that masterclass. It's on the 23rd of August at 7 p.m. UK time, which is 2 p.m. New York time and 11 a.m. Pacific time. So um, anyway, Tim, back to Tim first. So Tim taught me a lot about the slow carb principle and about uh, green cruciferous vegetables and about um, all different stuff like that. And one of the rules in this book, so we had these different rules that you had to uh, live by in order to lose body fat. And he promised like, you know, lose up to 2% body fat in two weeks. And one of the principles was no fruit. Okay. So I remember being like, huh, no fruit? It's weird because obviously I had always heard, like you probably, that fruit was extremely healthy. Fruit was extremely good for you. And fruit was a really, really good diet food. But Tim in the book explained how the primary sugar in fruit is fructose. Now, fructose is because there's three different types of fruit. There's fructose, glucose, and sucrose, okay? All three of them are sugar. But the body cannot use fructose as energy to fuel the muscles, so whenever fructose is ingested, it is absorbed into the bloodstream through the small intestine. It is sent to the liver and the liver converts it into triglycerides and sends it directly to fat store. That's it, right? That's the only place that fructose can go. Your liver can store a little bit of it to fuel the brain. So if your liver stores fructose, but it can only store, store a tiny amount, something like 15 blueberries amount of fructose, okay? Otherwise, it immediately converts the fructose into triglycerides, and triglycerides are the compounds that make up fat stores, okay? Whenever your body breaks down fat stores, whenever you're on a diet, it breaks down fat stores into triglycerides and transports them back through the tissues for energy. So it's a like a, a reverse process, but it obviously converts them into a different compound that can be used by the muscles. But whenever you ingest fructose, which is the primary sugar in fruit, the only place that fructose can go is into fat store, right? There's no other organ in the body except the liver that can use or store fructose. Now, is fruit extremely good for you? Yes, we're not disputing that. It has antioxidants. It has loads of other compounds. It has, you know, so you may be going, oh my God, I'm never eating fruit again because it's stored as fat. Well, no, it's not quite as simple as that because fruit does have a huge amount of nutritional properties which are extremely good for you. So sometimes it's it's fine to take the hit of the fat store because you're getting all of these other benefits. But I just want to be clear as to Whenever I learned this um, from Tim's book, it kind of blew me away. I was like, oh, wow, so fruit isn't the best diet food. Now, of course, um, what I learned through Tim's book as well, not what I learned, what I knew was it's not like you weren't eating a lot of nutrients because you're eating a huge amount of vegetables. So whenever we are being advised by the government as to you know what we should eat, you know, your five a day or 10 portions of fruit and vegetables a day, what people hear is 10 portions of fruit a day, but what they miss is 10 portions of fruit and vegetables per day, okay? Green vegetables contain just as many nutrients as fruit, but they don't contain fructose or they don't contain a huge amount of fructose. So they contain an, an enormous amount of fiber. So you're still getting your nutrients from green vegetables, but you're just not getting any of the sugar. So here's the thing, right? As to, so, well, here's what happened moving forward. So once I learned this, I basically 
cut a lot of fruit out of my diet. Now, what fruit would I eat today? I have a fruit salad every morning, which consists of berries, so strawberries, raspberries, and blueberries. Sometimes a little bit of pineapple or a peach or a nectarine cut up, but you know, just in small amounts. So I do consume fruit even when dieting, but I'm very careful about what fruit that I choose simply because fruit doesn't quite often move me towards my goal. So whenever I eat, I don't see the food as being, um, you know, delicious or pleasurable or, oh, I really want to eat this because it tastes so good. Taste is not my primary motivation when I eat. My primary motivation when I eat is, is the food on my plate moving me toward whatever goal I am working on at that moment? And this is the problem, I believe, with society. And it's the problem as to why so many of us get hung up on fruit and why Fruitgate even existed for me or for Lewis Howes. And the difference is that, or the, the problem is that we aren't clear as a society on what is healthy and what is moving you towards a measurable goal. Because healthy isn't measurable. Many of us want to be healthy. Many of us go, oh, I just want to be healthy, or this isn't healthy, or that's unhealthy, or that's good for you, or that's bad for you. So we have all of these determinations as to um, the food that we eat or what's available and what's not available, and we see them as healthy or not healthy, right? But whenever you try to get someone to define healthy, they can't define it because healthy is not subjective right? Sorry, it's not objective, it's subjective. What does this mean? Objective is a collective understanding or a collective definition of something. Everybody agrees on this definition. Subjective is when the definition is personal to me, when it means something to me. So to demonstrate this, what I like to say is, if I say to you the word mother, okay, Mother is is a word that we all understand, but mother means something different to each of us. Whenever I think of mother, I think of my mother. I think of whenever I was a child, how she used to smell. It was always of opium perfume. So how she used to smell, how she used to talk. I remember cuddles. I remember, you know, being given the silent treatment whenever I'd been bad. I remember, you know, um, loads of different things about my mother. She used to show dogs. Um, you know, my, my parents got divorced. Like there's so many different things that come up or that uh, that I conjure up whenever I think of the word mother. Um, as I say mother to you, you're probably thinking of your mother or whatever mother means for you. Sometimes it can be a very positive feeling. Sometimes it can be a very negative feeling. Maybe your mother was an alcoholic. Maybe she was very abusive or she hit you a lot when she was a child. Maybe she wasn't there for you. Maybe she was absent. Maybe you only had a father and you didn't have a mother. So mother for us is subjective. It's not objective, okay? And it's the same with the term healthy. Healthy isn't measurable. Healthy is subjective. It's not objective. So whenever we are, um, whenever we're thinking about fruit or whenever we think about food, the problem is many of us aren't clear on what healthy is. And we aren't clear on whether this thing that we're eating is moving us toward a goal or moving us away from a goal. Because as an athlete, right, I'm an athlete, we decide how to eat based on how it affects us, whether it moves us towards our goal or whether it moves us away from our goal. Now, before I had um, found Tim Ferriss and before I had, you know, become a, not even before I'd found Tim Ferriss, actually, before I became a physique athlete, before I started to train for competition and I started to become very um, precise with my nutrition, I never really thought about food as moving me towards a goal. I was a detox yoga teacher and I was obsessed with being healthy. So I was all about what's the healthiest option I can choose here. So I would have said, oh, never eat white grains, only ever eat whole grains. You know, white flour is bad for you. White bread is bad for you. You know, white rice is bad for you. Always whole grain rice, always whole grain bread, always whole grain pasta. You know, look for different, you know, like, you know, amaranth and quinoa and all these different things. And, and you know, don't blend your fruit, eat it whole and have green juices every day. And so my, my obsession before, and I am pretty much obsessed with anything I take on, but my obsession before I became a physique athlete was all about being healthy, right? I never thought about food moving me towards a goal, but the problem was I hadn't defined healthy. So every time I ate something that I considered to be not healthy, and understand this was based on a feeling, not based on data, right? I beat myself up. So 
And I think that is true for a lot of people. I think that we have decided in our mind or we have learned or taken in information through social conditioning, through how our, we were brought up, all these different things. We have decided what is healthy and what is not healthy. And it usually has a lot to do with the values that we learned as children and how we were punished for either eating or not eating different foods it has a lot to do with how we feel about food as an adult. And so therefore, I didn't really consider food to be, is eating this moving me towards a goal or away from a goal? I thought, you know, every time I had something that was that was bad or that I considered to be unhealthy, I felt really guilty about it and I beat myself up. And, and I didn't feel feel good for me. And I think that this is common for a lot of people. And definitely um, it was common for me up until about, I would say, let me think, it was quite a long time ago. I would say about um, 10 years ago. I remember I was watching a, um, a, I love to watch things on YouTube and I was watching a forum on YouTube where um, I can't even remember who it was, but it was it was a nutritionist or it wasn't it was a nutritionist, it was actually a life coach. Some kind of psychologist or life coach was was giving a forum on YouTube and I happened to stumble across it, I think when I was looking for TED Talks. And um, it was interesting because a person in the audience asked this, um, I think it was a psychologist, asked this psychologist about pizza, right? So what they said was, um, this psychologist was talking about, um, I think about goal setting and different things and about, you know, the feeling of guilt and discussing all these different concepts. And this person in the audience said, you know, well, I, I have something that I really struggle with. And they said, you know, I absolutely love pizza. And last night, you know, my we ordered pizza for the family and I told myself I was only going to have, you know, two slices of pizza because I do struggle with my weight a little bit, but I ended up having five slices of pizza. And I felt so guilty after I'd had the five slices of pizza and, you know, and, and I don't know what to do to overcome these feelings of guilt. Like I would love to overcome these feelings of guilt and I would love to not feel guilty and I would love to reframe the pizza and, you know, not feel guilty about it. You know, what do you suggest? And I'll never forget what the what the psychologist said. And she said, well, let me ask you something. She said, you know, um, she said, why was eating the pizza bad? And the person in the audience said, well, because I, you know, because it, it's fattening and, and you know, I'm a little, already a little overweight and, you know, pizza isn't a good diet food and whatever. And she said, no, but she said, what is the measurable goal that you're working towards? And the person in the audience said, I don't understand. And she said, well, here's the thing. She said, something is either good or bad when it moves us towards our goal or it moves us away from our goal. And she said, if you're not, if you're not working towards a measurable, definable goal, then the pizza is neither good nor bad. It's just pizza. But if you are on a calorie restricted diet where you have told yourself you're only going to eat or you've promised yourself whatever you're only going to eat 1500 calories a day because you're moving towards a specific goal and you go over the 1500 calories, then eating the pizza was bad. She said, if eating the pizza, say you're really short in your calories that day and you need five slices of pizza to get up to the 1500, then eating the pizza is good. But she said it's neither good nor bad unless it's moving you towards a goal or away from a goal. And that information absolutely and utterly blew me away. Because of course, like many people in my life, I had, you know, struggled with feelings of guilt and you know, sometimes I, I drank too much alcohol and then I felt guilty or sometimes I ate too much pizza and I felt guilty or sometimes I ate really healthy for a couple of days and I felt so good about myself and I felt so self-righteous and so wonderful that I was the kind of person who could move towards my goals or not even move toward my goals, but just eat really healthy food. I felt it meant something about me when I was the kind of person who was eating really healthy food and I became really self-righteous. But what I didn't realize was food is neither good nor bad. Food just either moves us towards a goal or it moves us away from a goal. But yet we beat ourselves up and we feel guilty without actually ever really defining whether something, like I said, is moving us towards a goal or moving us like, away from a goal. But do, have you ever considered, like, why do we do this? Like, why do we feel guilt? What is guilt, right? Well, guilt is self-corrective in nature, okay? it's It's a way that we beat ourselves up and punish ourselves. So, and, but the thing is, it's completely and utterly useless, right? Guilt is, guilt is self-protective. Like if I can show you how bad I feel, how guilty I feel, then you won't be angry with me and you won't punish me. I can punish myself 
far harder than you can ever punish me. So it's it's a way to be, um, it's, it's self-corrective, but it's also self-protective. And I think a lot of it stems from whenever we're kids and we're punished. So it's, it's you know, our parents punish us and they're like, they, you know, they punish us. And if we don't show the correct remorse, if we don't show the correct response, I'm really sorry, mommy. I'm really sorry, daddy. I shouldn't have done that. Like if we don't show that we feel guilty for what we did, our parents don't feel like we really understood. It's like, we have to show how bad we feel in order for our parents to leave us alone. Because quite often our parents are not punishing in integrity. They're not punishing based on a measurable standard that we achieved or failed to achieve. Our parents punish us because something feels bad or we trigger something in them, okay? So really we're fucked up from the very beginning. <laughs> we, never, we never really have a chance because our parents are screwed up, so therefore we become screwed up. Our parents don't understand these definitions, so they don't teach us these definitions. And therefore, we move into adulthood not really knowing what the fuck we're doing. So I'm trying to help you guys with that and try to give you the benefit of my experience and all of these definitions I've learned so you can live a little bit of a better life. So, but that is why we feel guilt, right? Guilt is, is all about, you know, being self-protective. But the problem is, or the thing is, it's actually not necessary. Guilt is not necessary. Guilt stems from being, from not being mindful or self-aware. Most of us go through life not having any standards for ourselves or any goals that we are trying to reach. So we just move through life. We just get up in the morning and go to school or go to work or, or you know, and get married and raise our kids. But we don't actually have standards for the type of parent we want to be, the type of worker we want to be, the type of, you know, body we want to have. We, we just stumble through life being very reactive in the moment, day to day, without actually working towards measurable goals. But, you know, like I said earlier, if you are, you know, even if we go back to the pizza example, if you are not working towards a measurable goal, then eating the pizza is neither good nor bad. It just is, right? Just like if you are, if you're not working towards, you know, um, any, a measurable goal in your fitness, for example, if you're not working towards a a measurable goal of eating 1,500 calories a day or getting down to 10% body fat or building four kilos of muscle or lifting 200 kilos this week instead of 180 kilos, then you're just going to the gym and you're just showing up and moving weights. So if you let yourself off the hook this week and you're not working towards a measurable goal, it's neither good nor bad. It's just, it just is. But, you know, and there's no point in feeling guilty over it because you're not actually working towards a goal. Whereas if you're working towards a goal, and I'm thinking about this myself because I hit a new personal best. I've only hit it once before um, of 200 kilos on the incline hack squat today. And I've been working towards 200 kilos. And so if I had to let myself off the hook today and said, no, 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 I don't want to do it today, that would have been bad because it wouldn't have moved me towards my goal. But I wouldn't have had to punish or beat myself up over it. It just would have been not moving me towards my goal and therefore bad. But I, the fact is I went for it. I did eight reps that moved me towards my goal. And so it was good. Okay. So there was no room for guilt or not guilt or not feeling guilt. And this is, this is where we get stuck in life. Okay. We get stuck because we don't know what we're moving towards and we don't know what we're moving away from. But just to bring it back to the fruit where this all began, we need to become really, really clear on whether what we're eating is moving us towards a goal or moving us away from a goal. And what I learned whenever I first learned about Tim Ferriss and the fruit and about fructose and triglycerides and all that kind of stuff is my goal of fat loss, which is why I had had bought the book in the first place, um, was very clear. And I knew exactly the percentage of body fat that I wanted to lose. And so I realized that eating fruit despite how healthy it was, would not move me towards my goal. So it removed all emotion out of it, and I got to assess it from a very objective point of view. Will eating this thing move me towards my goal or away from my goal? And that made it very objective and took all emotion out of it and helped me to be much clearer on my decisions. And just to demonstrate this a little further, just to give you a little more data, just to help you is I remember a story of whenever I was um, prepping for my second show. So the first year, loads of you who have listened to this podcast will, will remember, will have heard me talking about how whenever I was prepping for my first show, I didn't really, um, I didn't really follow the plan that my trainer gave me and I decided to do my own thing and I spectacularly failed. So the next year, whenever I, I went for my second show, I was so terrified of not being lean. I did everything that I was told, like everything, everything I was told and more. And I ended up being 
super, super, super lean, about 10% body fat. I was really, really, really lean, which was fantastic because that's what I wanted. But I remember a couple of days before the show, um, I think this, this, my first show was in England this, this year in London. And um, I live in Belfast, so I had to fly over there. And I was flying out on the Saturday morning and the show was on the Sunday morning. Now, whenever you are dieting for a show, you start to carb load a couple of days out from your show. So what does this mean? It means that you are your muscles are very depleted of glycogen because you have been carb depleting for the week. Uh, usually in, in the last week, it's called peak week. For the first, you know, three to four days, usually four days for me, from Monday to Thursday, I carb deplete, which means I'm only, only eating about 60 grams of carbs a day. And you do a lot of depletion workouts in the gym, which means you're trying to deplete your muscles of glycogen. And the reason why you want to do this is so that your muscles go really flat and really, really glycogen depleted. And then the two days before the show, you carb load. Whenever you carb load, your muscles get absolutely stuffed full of muscle glycogen and they really blow up. And also carb loading sucks all the water out of your body as well. So um, it really dries everything up. So that's what you want. You want to be really full and really dry on stage. And so I knew this, obviously, and but I still had this fear in the back of my mind because I hadn't been, I'd been dieting really hard and I had been staying so on point with my diet. My trainer had said to me, on the Friday morning, okay, so make sure that you start to carb load 300 grams of carbs today and tomorrow and, you know, to, to, to pump up your muscles, whatever. So on the Friday, I had been so busy running around and I hadn't eaten very much hardly all day. I was still in diet mode, okay? And even though I was like in the back of my mind, right, Curtis has told me to carb load, but I was like, you know, I'd, I just don't want to eat too much. Like I was, you know, still in this mindset of I still want to be really lean and, and I don't want to carb load in case I get bloated and blah, blah, blah. And so I didn't listen to him and I didn't carb load because I, I was afraid of the carbs because up until that point, carbs had been in inverted commas bad because eating carbs had moved me away from my goal. And I... I hadn't reframed it into, well, actually eating these carbs is going to move me towards my goal now. So whenever I went down to see Curtis on the Friday afternoon, he wanted to check my condition. He said to me, what have you eaten today? And I said, oh, I haven't eaten very much. And he said, what do you mean you haven't eaten very much if you're not being carb loading? And I said, well, no, because like, I'll carb load tomorrow. I didn't want to you know, carb load too early. And he was like, Kim, for fuck's sake, you need to carb load. Go and eat bagels and rice. And he, was, he sent me away and he was like, here's what you have to do. You have to go home and have a big bowl of oatmeal. I want you to have 200 grams of rice with dinner. I want you to have a bagel before bed. And I was like, really? Really? Am I allowed to eat all this stuff? He was like, it's necessary. It's not only that you're allowed to, you have to get your mind out of the fact that these are bad foods. These are necessary foods now for you to achieve your goal, which is looking really full and dry on stage. And I was like, oh my God, right. So I, I literally left and I went home and I had a massive meal and then I had more carbs that night and more carbs that, you know, the next morning and loads of carbs the next day. And it was amazing because for the first time probably in my life, it had completely and utterly reframed carbs for me. Because, you know, it's amazing the amount of people that say to me, oh, do you eat carbs? I'm like, do I eat carbs? I am a carb. <laughs> like, literally, carbs are responsible for building muscle. You need to eat a huge amount of carbs if you want to build muscle. So, but there's a whole keto movement is going around at the minute and everyone's like, oh, it's so afraid of carbs. And Dr. Atkins, he has a lot to answer for it. Yes, I eat loads of carbs. But up until that point, I guess, I... I wasn't as seasoned um, a trainer as I am now. I wasn't as seasoned an athlete as I am now. And so I still had a bit of a, an inverted, I was still learning, I guess. And I didn't really understand just how good carbs were. I was still stuck in the mindset that, you know, carbs were um, bad or, you know, that, you know, I, I had grown up with this, uh, probably the social conditioning mindset that many people grow up with, which is, you know, things like, what are the bad foods? Pizza, McDonald's, ice cream, chocolate. You know, we have all these, these are our bad foods. What are good fruits? What are good foods? Hell, you know, a fruit, um, uh, green vegetables, whole grains. You know, we, we read it constantly in the magazines, you know, and it's like they just repeat it over and over and over again. What is good for you? What should you eat if you want to lose weight? Well, increase your good fats and drink water with lemon juice and, you know, eat loads of fruit and vegetables and all this kind of stuff. But no one is actually asking, what is your goal? No one is teaching how to use food as a tool to achieve a precise goal. And this was the first time in my life that I'd ever eaten an enormous amount of carbs and felt really good about it because these carbs were moving me towards my goal. And in that moment, everything 
changed for me. It was fine for me to deprive myself of the foods that I, you know, while I was dieting, because that felt, even though it was hard, that felt normal for me. That felt like good. That felt like right and just and everything that I'd been taught my whole life. But this was the first time in my life that someone had instructed me to go and fill my face with carbs and not only to not feel bad about it, but to know that it was moving me towards my goal of potentially winning the show that I was going to compete in. And I I competed in uh, three classes that year and I came first, second and third in my three classes and they were huge classes. And so I did uh, really, really well and I was really pleased that I had carb loaded in the end because it did move me towards a goal. So what is what is the point of what I'm trying to say here? Well, Food is a tool, right? It's like I said, it's neither good nor bad. Eating is neither good nor bad, right? Eating is necessary for survival, okay? We eat to survive. Our ancestors did not have the luxury of working towards a measurable goal. They just foraged for food. Food was a way to um, load up in the summer on, you know, that's why fruits always grew in the summer, especially here in, it's different if you're in Australia and, you know, it's it's a warm climate and fruit was in abundance all year round. I know Australians are massive fruit eaters because of the climate, but here in Belfast, like the only thing that we really grow are apples and pears, okay? <laughs> Nothing else really grows here because we just don't have the climate for it. So fruit is very plentiful in the summer. And so you were supposed to fill up on fruit and grains and, and all those whole foods in the summer in order to get a little a bit fat because the body fat would have kept you through the winter, right? Body fat is a is is an energy storage tool that your body uses to get you through a period of shortage. But we're not surviving anymore in the world. We are, you know, we've moved far past that. So we have to, we, we, we have the luxury of using food and exercise and all of those things in a completely different way. So, you know, we don't need to survive anymore, but there are people in the world who actually surviving is their goal. There's people in developing countries and third world countries. There's people who are very, very short on money. And, you know, they don't have the luxury of using food as a tool. Food is a survival mechanism. They just eat whatever they can in order to survive. Sometimes they don't know where their next meal is coming from. And if food, if surviving is your goal, then eating all the food in the world that you can possibly get your hands on is good. It's forward moving. It's moving you towards your goal of surviving, right? But if you live in a privileged world where you um, food is no longer a tool for survival and can be used in many different ways, then food can be used to either move you towards your goal or move you away from your goal. Food is a tool. Food is a tool. How and when did our beliefs around food get so messed up? When did we use food as a, when did we learn to use food as a way to self-flagellate, as a way to either reward ourselves or beat ourselves up? How did we become so confused over food being a tool? Well, I think that the answer stems from I think it stems from childhood, which is where many of our things stem from, but I don't think that it's just food that we are messed up on, okay? I think that it, it's many things that we're messed up on because we're not used to goal setting and we're not used to evaluating. Recently, my sister found um, a report from whenever I was in boarding school. So I went to boarding school when I was seven and I was there until I was 12 and it was um, a very academic boarding school. And my sister found our report cards, which was like a little report booklet that you would have got. You know, the teachers would have written the report booklets and she found them at my dad's house when she was clearing some stuff out. And she gave me mine from when I was eight years of age. And I was reading, I started to read through the different um, reports, right? And even at eight years of age, I was doing maths or math, as it's called in America, English, geography, history, art, um, religious education, science, it was just called science. It wasn't phys- physics, chemistry, and biology in those days. And I was doing all these subjects at this age, and I was reading through my report card, and I was absolutely horrified by what I read. And in fact, it actually made me feel really deeply sad as I read some of the reports that the teacher had written because I could see how we develop confusion as young children because a lot of the not, I mean, all of the ones of art and English and the, the subjects that I was really good at 
were fantastic. You know, I got really high marks in my exams. Yes, at eight years of age, I was doing exams, horrifying. And I got really high marks. But then in the ones that I really hated, like geography, history, and science, I was never good at. It was all, oh, Kim needs to pull up her socks and try harder. Kim is a very intelligent young girl, but she's not applying herself in the way that she should. If she would just apply herself a little better, she would find herself with a deeper interest in the subject and blah, blah, blah. Like very harsh judgments, you know? And it was all about Kim is not performing in this subject the way she should be. She needs to apply herself more diligently to this subject and she needs to perform better. And it really made me sad because I was like, I was eight years of age. I was eight years of age. And and I, you know, and I would have been re reading this report card and imagine how whenever I read that, imagine how I must have felt about myself. You know, I am not a good person. I'm not an intelligent person. I'm not a smart person. I'm not a hardworking person. You know, all of these judgments that were being passed on me based on my ability to achieve a certain mark in geography or history or science or all of these subjects that I wasn't even interested in, right? My personhood was being judged by my ability to achieve a certain mark in these subjects. And what this made me realize is in directly in relation to what I'm talking about, in school, we are taught to believe that achieving a level of proficiency in a subject will somehow make us a better human being, okay? We need to learn for the sake of learning. Learning is the most important thing. But yet many of us don't actually stop to consider, why are we obsessed with filling our children up with knowledge? Why? What does it achieve? What does filling your children up with knowledge in every single subject achieve? Now, when I ask this question, parents usually say to me, well, it makes them an all-round better human and it teaches them about the world. No, 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 it doesn't. How you learn about the world is through living in the world. How you learn about bodybuilding is being a bodybuilder. How you learn about business is running a business. I did business studies in university and it taught me nothing. I barely scraped a 2-2, two -two, which is one mark up from a third, which is the lowest possible mark you can get in a degree. I nearly got kicked out of university for not for failing all my exams in the first year. I took a load of drugs and I got a first in partying. That's what I got a first in university, a first in partying. And there is not one single thing that I use or remember from my business studies degree that has enabled me to be the businesswoman I am today. Do you know what enabled me to be the businesswoman I am today? experience. Experience and getting in the trenches and running a business. Theory teaches you nothing without application. But yet we are obsessed with filling our children up with knowledge. But imagine how different the world would be if instead of trying to fill our children up with knowledge and hoping that it's going to hit some end goal, imagine if we allowed them to choose an end goal and then learn the tools to achieve that goal. School subjects are tools for us to get what we want in life. They are tools to achieve a goal. I hated math in school. I hated it. I was terrible at it. I couldn't see the point in learning Pythagoras' theorem and and long multiplication and all of the different things that they they sit you down and force you to learn in school. I couldn't see the point of it. I couldn't see how learning any of this shit applied to my life. So I was not motivated to learn it. Okay. And I really was and I wasn't very good at following the rules either. So the loads of kids are just like, this is what you do. Their parents drill it into them. This is what happens. This is what you do, blah, blah, blah. But I could not see the point in learning all of this shit. Okay. Now I run a multi-million dollar company. And math is my best friend. Why is it my best friend? Because it's necessary for me to achieve my goal of running my company. I need to be able to read balance sheets. I need to be able to work out percentages. I need to be able to work out profit margins and, and you know, and, and all of that stuff, okay? So math is actually my best friend because now the, uh, math is a tool for me to be able to run my business. And whenever you are motivated towards an end goal, learning is fun, Learning is fun when you're motivated towards an end goal. I taught myself internet marketing in eight years, and I now own the world's largest vegan online bodybuilding company. 
I wasn't forced to learn it in school. I learned it because I was motivated. Whenever I was in school, internet marketing did not exist. Now, I think that they do teach it in school, but it didn't exist whenever I was in school. In fact, marketing didn't exist. There was there was no sales subjects when I was in school. There was no, no it wasn't even a subject, no accountancy in my school. Nothing like that. It was all the pure sciences. Ge- it was all the pure subjects, geography, history, math, French, English, all of that stuff, Okay. I learned French in school. I did French up to A level. Do you know the thing that taught me French was living in the country. And then whenever I went back into school to do my final year in my A level, I could see how learning all this would actually move me towards my goal, which is I wanted to go and live in France at some point. So you have to be able to see the end goal and then you can choose the the tools that you use to move you towards that goal. Why is this important? Okay. How does subjects in school, and you know I always try and bring it back to school because you know how I feel about school if you listen to this podcast. It's not that I don't like school. I just think that the way we teach our children is totally and utterly messed up and it needs, no, I don't think it's messed up. I think it's antiquated. And I think that it needs a massive, massive, massive reform. Okay. So how does this, how does this relate to what I'm talking about? Well, fruit as a food has components has nutrients, it has um, fructose, it has antioxidants, it has loads of different things, okay? Fruit in and of itself is neither good nor bad. It's just fruit. Fruit can either move you toward your goal or move you away from your goal. If your goal is to diet, then science suggests that fruit is not the best diet food simply because Fructose, which is present in fruit, is converted into triglycerides, transported through the tissues to the fat cells, okay? And it is literally stored as fat immediately. So if your goal is to stop your body from storing fat, and your goal is to not spike your blood sugar, and your goal is to feel full, then fruit is not the best choice. Now, if your goal is to pump your body full of antioxidants. If you have had a some kind of disease or you're getting over an illness and you have been advised to eat a high sugar diet or you have been advised to eat a diet full of antioxidants, then fruit is a very good choice because fruit will move you towards your goal. And, and so this is the thing, right? This is what people feel to recognize whenever they become obsessed with fruit. And whenever I talked about Fruitgate, whenever I discussed, well, I didn't talk about Fruitgate, but it became known as hashtag Fruitgate. Whenever I discussed fruit and in my 18-month group, whenever I was doing the Q&A and I said to this specific person, fruit is making you fat, it was true because she was consuming an enormous amount of fruit. She was blending fruit into fruit juices. Her body was getting far too much fructose and that fructose was being stored as fat. So I said, fruit is making you fat. What the world heard was, how dare you take away my fruit? How dare you suggest that fruit is making you fat? Fruit is is extremely healthy and should be part of a a balanced diet. Yada, 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 yada. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear you. I hear you giving off, right? And and I, but here's the thing, okay? I was completely stunned, like I said in the beginning, stunned as to how much backlash I got from Fruitgate. And but that's why I decided to do this podcast today, because what I realized was twofold, okay? Fruitgate taught me a couple of things. Here's what it taught me. In fact, three, three things fruit fruitgate taught me. First one is people get fearful when their beliefs are challenged. We are obsessed as a nation with being healthy. And we believe on some level that if we are healthy, everything in the world is okay. We are okay. Our children are okay. We're going to live long and healthy lives. And we are fearful of not being healthy, right? But also, we don't like our beliefs to be challenged. We are not open to new ideas or to information or data coming in that challenges what we need to be true. Because understand, when you get fearful, when you when you get um, defensive, the minute you get defensive, it is what has happened is you have uncovered a limiting belief. What causes a limiting belief? Fear. If you're open to new information and you're open to new data, 
then you are not fearful. The minute you need to defend something, you are fearful. You have uncovered unlimiting belief, which is fantastic. Number two that I learned from Fruitgate and from the backlash I got was that we have raised a nation of sheep who have lost the ability to be critical thinkers. We aren't aware enough to realize that A, we are having a reaction, and B, what we are seeing is literally a tiny snapshot of the full picture. Whenever I saw Lewis Howes interviewing Dr. Stephen Gundry on his podcast, and I saw that one minute snapshot, in fact, I think it was one minute, 45 second snapshot, right? I immediately said, oh, well, that's interesting. That's a one minute, 45, one minute, 45 second snapshot of probably a 60 minute podcast. So there's probably an awful lot more data here, which I am not seeing. But the reason why I was able to do this is because I am a critical thinker. I can see a tiny snapshot of information and realize that it's probably part of a much larger piece of information. I can also see a piece of information that I don't agree with, and I can disagree emphatically with something, and I cannot make it mean anything about the person. I can go, isn't that interesting? I disagree with what that person is saying. Am I actually going to comment on it and go, I disagree. How dare you? How dare you talk about fruit? How dare you say that eating mangoes is bad and that that grapes are little fruit bombs? No, I can just go, interesting. I disagree. Do I have the time or the inclination to get into a discussion here about, you know, our differing point of views? No. So what am I going to do? I'm just going to move on. (laughs) I'm just going to move on because it's not important enough to me to get into an argument over what I what I believe to be true and what this person believes to be true. There is a rule by Dr. Jordan Peterson, who's one of my favorite psychologists, and he says in his book, 12 Rules for Life, one of the rules is assume that the person you are talking to knows something you don't. For me to say, I am right and you are wrong is so limiting in every single way. People just don't realize how doing that to someone or doing that to yourself absolutely 100% cuts off all learning and it cuts off all possibility in the world for you to be better than you are now. If you believe that you are right and the other person is wrong, you are completely closed off to any new data coming in. If you are closed off to new data, you are stuck. You are stuck exactly where you are with no opportunity to move anywhere in the world because you have decided that you are right and that person is wrong. Whenever you do that to yourself, I mean, if you're the kind of person who just wants to stay exactly where you are and not progress or move or grow in the world, then that is totally fine. You be right and make everybody else wrong and you stay stuck where you are. But I am the kind of person, and I'm guessing that you may be too because you're listening to this podcast, who wants to grow and expand in the world and make more money and grow more muscle and and have more opportunity and travel more and meet more people and be open to new and differing point of views. And you cannot be both ways. You cannot make someone else wrong and your beliefs right but also be the kind of person who's open to possibility and change and wants to grow and move in the world. The more flexible you are in your beliefs, the more flexible you are in your arguments, and the more open you are to hearing differing point of views without needing to defend or make the other person wrong, the more chance you have of success in the world. The third thing I realized from from Fruitgate was that 99% of the world is completely self-absorbed and unaware. (laughs) completely self-absorbed and unaware. We see Dr. Stephen Gundry and we go, you are bad. You are wrong. You don't know what the fuck you're talking about. Okay. Because we don't even realize that what someone has said has triggered us so badly that we can't even take in any more data. When I remember hearing this years ago, someone said about, um, I think it was Tony Robbins. I was listening to one of his stuff and some of his stuff. And he said, When someone is in fight or flight, they stop taking in data. So what does this mean? You know, whenever, have you ever driven along and you see a cop car in the thing that goes, and you go, fuck, and it sets your fight or flight off, right? And you start to tremble and your adrenaline goes and it sets your fight or flight off. Whenever 
your fight or flight is is triggered, you stop taking in data. And whenever, like we see this with children all the time, whenever children are having an enormous emotional reaction to something and they're crying and screaming, have you ever tried to reason with a child or even with your wife or your husband or your mother or father who's having a massive emotional meltdown and you're trying to reason with them and they are just like, just like not taking in anything you're saying? That's because when someone is in fight or flight, they're not taking in data. What we have to get more aware of as human beings is the fact that we are triggered by something and then separating our emotional reaction from the data. So uh, one of my favorite quotes is, uh, freedom lies in the capacity to pause between stimulus and response. I see the sculpted vegan saying, fruit is making you fat. And I go, oh, how dare she? How dare she? Right? If we can go, oh, I just had a big emotional reaction. Let me just think about this for a second before I write a really angry comment on her Instagram page. Let me just evaluate. Let me get some more data. Is actually, is what I think she's saying actually what she's saying? Imagine how different the world would be if we did that, right? Imagine how different the world would be if we actually went, this is what I believe to be true. Is this actually true? Is this actually what she's saying? My husband and I do this, um, do this exercise whenever, I can't remember where I got this from. I think it was uh, Jordan Peterson again. We do this exercise where whenever we are having an important discussion about something to do with the kids or us or the family or whatever, whenever one person is putting across their point of view, so let's say Ryan is telling me his point of view and what he believes, I have to repeat back to him what he has said, my understanding of what he has said, right? Before I can respond with what I think, I have to repeat back to him what he has said or my understanding of what he has said. And he has to agree with my version, agree that I have understood him correctly before I can speak. Then I speak and before he gets to respond, he has to repeat back to me what I've said or what his understanding is of what I've said before then he gets to speak. This is absolutely and utterly transformational for your marriage and for your relationships. Because you're not making an assumption about what you think the other person is saying. You're actually understanding what they intend to say. So we hear someone speak, right? And we under, we think we understand what they're saying. And then we respond based on our understanding. Sometimes and oftentimes our understanding is incorrect. This is what happens when we take in data. It's what happened with me with Fruitgate. It's what happened with Dr. Stephen Gundry with Fruitgate. It's what happens whenever someone is having an emotional reaction to something. And fruit seems to be an enormous emotional trigger for people. And I really, truly do not know why. I've tried, tried it on and tried to think about it. And the only thing I can think as to why fruit would be an enormous emotional trigger for people. And maybe if you, if fruit is an emotional trigger for you, I would love for you to write to me. Please write to me, the Sculpted Vegan on Instagram. Send me a DM and tell me why. If you're, if fruit is an emotional trigger for you, please tell me why, because I truly want to understand more. I just, it's, I love understanding people and I want to know why. The only thing I can think of is because of, is of what we've discussed. And I'm open to being wrong, that we have this obsession with being healthy. We're punished for eating bad food as children and we're rewarded for eating good food. And therefore we place a lot of our self-esteem and our feeling of self-worth and our feeling of, of, of being human, of being a good human or a bad human based on our ability to be healthy or not healthy. And if you try and take away someone's fruit, then what you are essentially doing is taking away their goodness, taking away their good intent at the deepest, deepest level. That's all I can think of. That's the only reason why I can think of as to why fruit would be such a strong emotional trigger for people. But whenever you become, whether it's an emotional trigger or not, whenever you become very aware of your emotional triggers and what drives you and what, what, um, what you react to, everything changes. Everything changes. Because here's another, just something else I want to bring home to you before we finish, before I get to my final point, is that I want you to consider what actually self-awareness is. I, I had a, a friend of mine recently say to me, oh, you know, I'm so self-aware that blah, blah, blah. And she told me why she was so self-aware. This person does do a lot of personal work, okay? They're always trying to figure out why do I think this way and why do I do this and, and why, you know, I am this way and blah, 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 all these different things. And I was talking to my coach and I said to her, 
I was discussing this person and I said, you know, but she's very, very self-aware. And she said to me, it doesn't seem like she's self-aware. And I said, well, why do you say that? She said, because true self-awareness is when you understand how your actions affect other people. It's not just understanding your actions. It's understanding how your actions affect others, which is empathy. True empathy is understanding how you affect others. And she said, self-awareness is not just understanding yourself, it's understanding how you affect others. And this person doesn't really seem to be aware of how her actions are affecting you. And so she's not truly self-aware. And I was like, blown away. I was, oh my God, that is so true. It's so true. And I think that we lack self-awareness as a race and as a culture. We first of all lack, we lack the first layer of self-awareness, which is, oh, wow, I'm having an emotional reaction to something that this person is saying, okay? Why is this triggering me? Why is this upsetting me? Why am I so emotionally invested in fruit, right? And then secondly, we lack the awareness as to how, if I react to this person, how my anger or my punishment or my shame or, you know, my wrath on them may affect them. We lack that awareness. And without these two layers of awareness, we're just running, we're like, we're no better than dogs, right? We're no better than animals. We're no better than, than, than sheep, okay? If we can't develop self-awareness as a culture, as a person, as a race, then we, we, we lack values, we lack principles, we, we, and we will lack the ability to achieve our goals in life. You, you, if you can't, if you can't separate yourself from the things that you love or the things that you think you need to be okay, such as fruit in this instance, it seems quite crazy whenever you talk about it, but it is very true. Many of us believe, need to believe that fruit is healthy and good. And don't get me wrong, fruit is healthy and good, right? It's not like, you know, it's not like eating a candy bar or, you know, hydrogenated fats. If you put the two, those two together, you would say, which one is better? Well, yeah, fruit is better. But fruit may not always move you towards your goal. And if you're not clear on what your goal is, then fruit is neither good nor bad. It's just fruit, right? So how are we going to sum all this up? Well, here's what I would ask you to do moving forward, is when you find yourself wanting to defend something, consider that it may be a sign that you have uncovered a limiting belief. Limiting beliefs, finding and uncovering limiting beliefs is wonderful. It's how you grow. It's how you move forward uncovering them, becoming aware of them, and then challenging them is how we grow as a human race. The more you can challenge your limiting beliefs and bring them into the open, the more you can uncover your rules. The more you can uncover your rules, the more successful you will be. Rules are based on ethics or fear, okay? If you stop at a red light in your car, you understand the ethic of not running a red light because you may hurt somebody. You may kill someone. You may hit another car. You may hit a pedestrian. You want, and so not killing someone and not causing chaos and disorder is an ethic for you. It's a principle that you live by, right? But if you, if you choose not to eat something because you're scared of eating it or because sugar is bad or because fruit is good or any of these things, this may be a rule that you have, which is based on a fear you don't even know that you have, which is deep down in there, probably built somewhere in your childhood that you carried through to adulthood that may not serve you anymore. But when you uncover these rules, when you uncover these limiting beliefs, you can move forward so much more successfully and open-mindedly in your life. Educate yourself on how and why what you eat is moving you towards your goal or away from your goal and guilt will cease to exist. You do not need to feel guilty in your life. Guilt is completely and utterly useless. If you've realized that you have done something which has hurt someone else or you've realized you've done something which has compromised your own ethics, then fix the thing that you broke. Apologize to the person or, you know, make right whatever you have wronged and then you can move on. You, guilt, there's no point in feeling guilt. There's no point in beating yourself up over it, right? Guilt is, is so useless as an emotion. If you cause harm, fix the harm and move on. 
and there's no need to feel guilty about it. Whenever you commit to this, it's incredible what happens. It opens up a whole new world and makes you so much more purposeful, driven, and goal-oriented. You stop punishing yourself. You stop punishing your children. And together, you know, whenever whenever you learn to live this way, together, it sounds very, like, kooky and, you know, and whatever, but we can build a better world. You know, the more self-aware we are, the less rule-bound we are, the less fearful we are, the more we understand how something is neither good nor bad unless it's moving us towards or away from our goal, the less fearful we are, the more purposeful we will become, and the more successful we can be. Fruit is full of fructose. Fruit will cause your body to store body fat. If that's not important to you, that's perfectly okay. If you want to lose body fat, consider that fruit may not be the best possible choice. But don't get upset about it. (laughs) And don't make it mean anything more than it means. And if data comes in around food that challenges what you believe, be open to hearing the data and then make a decision with more data. Whatever data you have right now is all you have. Be open to hearing more. Be like a little in private investigator into all of the data that may be out there, that may exist, that challenges what you believe. And then form your own opinion. And that opinion will be based on, on, on data. It will be based on evaluation. And it won't be based on fear. The less our opinions are based on fear, the more successful we can be in the world. So I know I got quite deep there. Um, It was a hard podcast for me to plan because it wasn't really about fruit. It was more about the deeper understanding of how these concepts trigger us, right? And, And about the shock that I felt when I realized that fruit was a very emotional subject for many people. So I would love for you to write to me. I would love to hear what are your views on fruit if it triggers you, okay? If you have no feeling around it, you're like, nah, it doesn't trigger me at all, then that's fine. You can write and tell me that too. But if fruit is is an emotional subject for you, I would love to know why. Truly, this is something that really interests me because I, I, I find it very hard to try it on and, um, and I definitely would love more data. Uh, don't also forget two things, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, we have the meal planning masterclass, which is happening on the 23rd of August, 7 p.m. UK time, 2 p.m. Uh, New York time, 11 a.m. Pacific. It's going to run for about three hours, but we're going to have a good 15 to 30 minute break in the middle. I'm going to teach you everything that you need to know about planning and tracking your food. We're going to create a meal plan together. Um, to achieve your goals, whether it be muscle building, whether it be fat loss, whether it be just living a, you know, a healthier life. I'm going to teach you how to uh, be very specific with what you want and how to plan your nutrition around that specific goal. Go to the website, thesculptedvegan.com. You can sign up for the masterclass. A replay will be available and it will be yours for life um, after after the, the event. Even if you can't show up live, definitely sign up if it's something that interests you and we will send you the replay. Also, don't forget to leave me the review, send me a screenshot on Instagram and tell me your thoughts on fruit if it's an emotional trigger for you because I definitely want to find out more about that too. Guys, thank you so much for listening. I hope that you enjoyed this podcast and I hope you have an absolutely wonderful week wherever you are in the world and wherever you are listening to this. I love you all very, very, very much and I know that sounds very shallow to say but it is true. I imagine all of you listening to this and it fills me with great joy And I will speak to you all next week on another episode of Strong and Sculpted. Take care and bye for now.